Well, good evening and welcome to our Christmas Eve service where we are celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ. And for all of you kids who already uh, were up here singing, um, you began preaching this message before I ever did. Uh, Thank you for what you shared. Our kids are not the church of tomorrow, they're the church of today. And they're up here proclaiming the gospel uh, to us and reminding us. And so thank you, all of you young people who who sang. Tonight, I want to begin by asking you a question. And the question is this. Um, If you could ask God himself... Uh, Maybe you could sit down face to face and you could have a conversation with God and you could ask him for any one thing this year. You could ask him for health, maybe, that you would be healed of every disease or sickness or whatever it is that might be ailing you. Or maybe you could ask him for one more minute or day or hour or, 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 or week with someone that you've loved. Or maybe you would ask God for provision because this has been a difficult year. Um, Whatever it might be, I want you to imagine that you could ask God this one question. You're like, hey, God, if you could have any one thing, you could ask him for it. And he would give it to you. Now, this is, this is, you should think about this because it's, it's more significant than you might think because he's the God of the universe. He's the God who created everything that we know and see. He's all powerful. Whatever it is that you can dream up, God can totally fulfill that request. So if you sat down before God and you had a conversation with him tonight, what would you ask him for? What's the thing that's on your heart, the need um, that that you're experiencing or the the desire that you might have? Maybe it's the hurt that needs mending. Tonight, what I want to talk to you about is this belief that I have inside me. That no matter how significant your request, no matter how profound the need it is that you're experiencing, no matter like how big or urgent the situation that you're, that is that you might be facing, you could never ask God for something greater than what he has already given us in the person of Jesus Christ. There is a reason that we celebrate Christmas and the birth of Jesus when God took on flesh and he made his dwelling among us. Now, what I don't want to do is trivialize whatever it is that you might be needing or longing for on this day, but what I want to show you is that ultimately, through the work of Jesus Christ, we have not only the things that we might ask of him, but we have so much More Tonight, I'm going to invite you to turn with me to John chapter 3. If you grew up in church like me, this is probably the first verse that you ever memorized that, you know, maybe you you got extra points, got a a check mark by your name in Sunday school, whatever it might have been. Uh, It's a really, really simple verse, but it's a profound one. There's a reason why we give so much attention to this verse in particular. I'm going to read it to you, and I'm going to make a few remarks. Uh, I know that we're packed in tonight. Thank you uh, for being here, and those of you who are sitting uh, closer to someone than you otherwise wish to be sitting, thank you for making room for everyone. Um, it's a wonderful time to celebrate, and I'm glad uh, that we're so full tonight. I want to read this verse in John chapter 3 to you. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, That whoever believes in him should not perish, but would have eternal life. I'm going to read it one more time. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now, right at the outset, as as you think about this verse... Um, I want you to see who the active agent is. The one who's doing all of the work here um, is God. This verse begins with two simple words, for God. But we're reminded in two simple words that God is the one who does the work. Many people approach faith and they approach God and they approach religion and they're thinking, I've got to do some work. I've got to clean myself up. I've got to be good enough. I've got to try hard enough. If I'm going to have a relationship with God, I've got to get some things together. But at the outset, this profound verse that tells us about the nature of God, it reminds us at the very front end that this isn't about you and it's not about me and it's not about our work, what we do or didn't do, but it's all about what God has already done for God. And then it reminds us of the motivation 
of God. It says, for God so loved. Now, I don't know what impression of God you may have grown up with. Uh, For some of us, God was a little bit scary. I was a fairly ornery kid. Uh, I almost burned this church down one time when I was young. I mean, I got into some things. And if you have any sort of legalistic view of God, which means you kind of relate to God on, uh, you know, how well you're doing. Am I keeping the rules? Am I breaking the rules? It can be a fearful thing to think, and I've broken so many rules. And so we believe that God must be mad at us. He might be out to, to judge us or punish us, or even worse, he might even be out to condemn us. But when God looked at the world, and more importantly, when God looked at you, when God looked at me, even in the midst of a difficult story, in the midst of painful circumstances, in times where we've sinned and gone our own way, God looked at us and he loved us. How much did he love us? He loved us enough that he gave his only son. You know, no gift that we'll ever receive is ever actually free. I mean, if you're a kid and an adult here, tomorrow morning you might get up and you get to unwrap some presents. And as, as wonderful as they may be and as free as they may be to the recipient, they were very costly to somebody else. I know that my wife and I, in our shopping, we did what we, we this year, what we do every other year. We've, we've gone over budget, right? We shouldn't be shocked, right? Prices are up, and there are people that we want to give to and bless. And so we've overspent, and we're going to feel that, right, going forward. Like, uh, maybe spent too much. When we think about God giving his only son, and that gift is something that we receive, and it's free to us, but it was extraordinarily costly to him. We're reminded that in the coming of Jesus Christ, he came to die on the cross for our sins. That he suffered and he bled and he died for us. And while that gift is free to us, it was extraordinarily costly to God. What I want you to see here tonight is that God looked at you and he looked at me and he was so moved with love that he was willing to pay the price for us. He was willing to sacrifice his only son for us. And for you, for God so loved the world. Now, it would make sense here if it said God so loved the Hebrew people of the Old Testament, right? They were descendants of Abraham, and God had said to them, I'm going to be your God, and you'll be my people. Um, Or it would make sense here if it said God so loved, you know, those that would love him in return, right? Those who are going to you know, live pretty good lives and do a lot of good in the world, those who will represent God well. But it doesn't say that. It says God so loved the world. And that means that God loves the people that we love, certainly. And God loves the people that are difficult for us to love. And God loves the people that we might even be tempted to hate. The people that, we, that have done things to us that we might struggle to forgive, that we might have bitterness against, God looked at them and he loved them enough to, to pay this price, to, to offer his one and only son. God loved us, even those of us who will give him nothing back in return. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. I'll, Maybe another question would be, why would God send his son? Why did God have to send Jesus into this world? Why would he send his only son to suffer and ultimately to die on the cross? What was the necessity there? Romans chapter 3 verse 23 tells us that all of us have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. We all have sinned. We were born into it. From our earliest of days, we've sinned against God and against other people. Like This is not something I often have to convince people of. We've all blown it, right? We know that deep down. And in Romans chapter 6, it tells us that the wage of that sin is death. Do you know why God had to send his only son to suffer and to bleed and to die for us? Because you and I owed a debt that we couldn't pay. Because of our sin, we were separated from God. And God, because he loved us so much, because he desired for us to have a relationship, because he loved the world and wanted to redeem the world and restore that which has been broken by sin, God sent his only son knowing what it was going to cost him. Jesus went to the cross willingly 
for us. And he did that so that whoever believes in him would not perish, but would have eternal life. The word perish here, uh, there, there's certainly more to the story than just dying a physical death. That's going to happen to all of us at some point in this life. Unless Jesus returns, we're all going to face physical death at, at some point. But the word perish here isn't merely talking about that physical death, but rather it's talking about, last week we talked in church about a second death, about eternity separated from God in a place called hell. And God saw the world. He saw us. He saw you. And he knew your name. He knew the number of hairs on your head. He knew the life that you were going to live. God saw you and sent his only son, Jesus, so that you wouldn't spend eternity separated from God in a place called hell, but rather that you might have eternal life, that you might spend eternity with God in heaven in a place that God is going to create where there will be a new heaven and a new earth where there's no sickness and no hurting and no pain and no more death. God did that for us. I ask you about the request that you would make before God. And for many of us, it revolves around sickness or hurting or pain. Maybe it's provision. Maybe it's the struggles that we face in this life. And what we're reminded in the first coming of Jesus is that he's going to come back again. Jesus one day is going to return. There will be a new heaven and a new earth where there will be no more suffering and no more pain. There will be no more need. There will be no more longing, no more loneliness or sadness or tears. The world will be restored to the same Christian, uh, cre uh, condition that God created it to be. It will be perfect once again, I told you that I believe that in, in sending his son, Jesus, God gave us a greater gift than anything we could ever ask for. What we're reminded of is that in, in receiving Jesus Christ, in receiving this free gift that he gave, we don't, we're not going to be reunited with loved ones for moments or for minutes or for days or for hours, but we can be reunited with them for an eternity. That we won't be healed for a little while until the next round of COVID comes or next flu season hits will be healed for an eternity. That whatever it is that we're dealing with in this moment, it will be taken away and hurting and suffering will be no more. Now there's just one part of this verse that I haven't talked to you about, and that's how to receive this gift. The gift of His Son that God sent, that we wouldn't perish, but we would have eternal life. And in John chapter 3, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him, that's the condition. That's the condition for receiving the gift. Whoever would believe in him. Now, believe here, it isn't believing that Jesus was a person or a good moral example or even if you're kind of into religious studies, a great prophet. To believe here is something much more significant than we often think, like mental assent to something. Oh yeah, I believe he was a real guy. He existed in, you know, kind of the Saudi Arabian area or somewhere around that Middle Eastern uh, part of the world, right? Billy Graham used to tell it like this. To believe, to have faith in God, um, it, it would be imagining a, a really deep gorge. And you know that if you were to fall off into that gorge... You, you wouldn't make it. But there's a, a bridge. It's from one side to the next. And it may not look like the most profoundly strong bridge you've ever seen, but it's a bridge nonetheless. Um, to believe in Jesus is not merely to believe that the bridge could support your weight. To, to believe in Jesus is to entrust that bridge to take care of you, to entrust that bridge with your life. When we talk about whosoever believes in Jesus will not perish, but will have eternal life, that belief means not merely believing that Jesus existed, that he lived, that he was here, but it's trusting in him to save you from your sins and is entrusting him with your entire life becoming obedient as he would lead you, following Jesus wherever he might send you. It is entrusting your entire life to him. And so tonight, I don't know where you are. Maybe you were invited here by a friend. You came to watch the kids sing because it's amazing and it's beautiful and it's a blessing. But tonight, as you think about who you are before God, 
And you think about this amazing gift that God has given us that I believe is more significant than anything we could even ask for in the person of Jesus, the gift of his own son. I would ask you, have you ever truly believed in Jesus? I'm not asking if you prayed a prayer or if you walked an aisle or if you believe that God existed. Have you ever entrusted yourself to God to save you from your sin? And to follow him with your whole life, entrusting yourself to him fully. Really, the message of Christmas is the message of the gospel. It's the hope of the world because it's the hope that God provided for us who could not save ourselves. Before God, we could never be good enough. We could never put God in our debt and somehow earn our way to his favor. But God so loved the world. God so loved you that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but would have eternal life. Tonight, that's the message that the kids began speaking to you when they came and they sang their song, Let Me Tell You About My Jesus. And that's the message that I want to share with you on this night in a crowded room full of people, that God loved you enough to send his son Jesus that if you would receive him in faith, he would save you and he would transform your life. And that's not something that's going to happen one day when you die, but it's something that happens the moment that we come to faith in him and we begin living our life with God, experiencing that abundant and eternal life in him where we find fullness of joy and peace that transcends understanding, where we have a relationship with the God of the world. We get to walk with him and talk with him and know him even as he knows us. So tonight, the invitation for you is to entrust yourself to Jesus, to respond in him in faith, to receive this free gift that he offers us here as we celebrate Christmas. Right now, I'm going to invite you to bow your heads with me. And we don't do this very often here. But tonight, if you find yourself in need of a Savior, if you think about your life and your debt before God, do you recognize that you're a sinner who's in need of a Savior? I don't want you to hesitate for a moment. Tonight, you can cry out to Jesus to save you from your sin. You can trust him with your whole life. And Jesus will do exactly what he said he will do. He will save you from your sin. And he will give you new life in him that is beyond anything you could ever ask or imagine. Tonight, with every head bowed and every eye closed, the way that we would receive this gift of salvation is by acknowledging our own sin, believing that Jesus Christ died on the cross and he rose again on the third day, by confessing him as the Lord of our lives. Tonight, I I wonder if anyone would be so bold as just to say, that's me. Would anyone here be willing to lift their hand and say, you know what, I'm I'm a sinner and I'm in need of a Savior. Tonight, I recognize that I need Jesus Christ to save me. Would anyone be so bold as to raise their hand and say, that's me? Thank you. Anybody else, would you lift your hand and say, that's me, I need to be saved tonight? Thank you. Thank you. Listen, if if that's you, um, there's a lot of people here, and I'm not going to invite you to come forward at this very moment. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to lead you in a prayer here in just a moment. Uh, But one of our first steps of following Jesus Christ in obedience when we come to faith in him is to make that public And so I'm going to be here when this service is over. Um, I'm going to be here all next week. We'll we'll be here gathered as a church. I would love to visit with you more about what it means to follow Jesus and trust in him. But tonight, if that was you and you felt God drawing your heart to him in faith, would you just pray this prayer with me and then make a commitment to make this public to tell if you're a young person, tell your parents. If you're an adult, would you come visit with me or someone who's sitting in the row next to you? Be public about your faith and begin entrusting your entire life with him. So right now, I'm going to invite you to pray with me. As you sit there, would you pray, Lord Jesus? God, I believe that you sent your son, Jesus, 
to die on the cross for my sin. Lord, I confess that I'm a sinner who's in need of a Savior. And God, you sent your son Jesus to save me and to be the Lord of my life. God, I commit my life to you. I entrust my whole self to you. Lord, I pray for the forgiveness that comes from you. I pray that you would fill me and give me new life in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.